So, so uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm excited to sort of continue the theme of this session in talking about how we can scale these mutagenesis and screening approaches to look at multiple proteins in, in a single experiment. I don't need to introduce the, the problem to this audience, which is the huge gap between the number of mutations that we can catalog in human and, and other animal genomes um, with the ones that we really understand the phenotype. So most mutations, we have no idea what they're actually doing, whether it be uh, clinically or you know, during evolution. But what I really want to highlight is that at least when you're looking at missense mutations, all proteins in the proteome have been found to be affected by missense mutations. And even if we limit this to just proteins that have known clinical effects, uh, in the database ClinVar, there are over 3,000 proteins that have missense mutations with clinical annotations in them. And although deep mutational scanning approaches are extremely powerful for systematically looking at the effects of every mutation, they're generally, at least currently, not really scalable to look at all these proteins that we may be interested in. Uh, so the goal of, of my work has been to develop new methods that can measure the effects of protein variants in many proteins simultaneously. And we do this by um, applying generic biochemical selections for protein function and using a, a mass spec based proteomics readout. Uh, so the overview of the methods that we have, have developed um, is actually quite different in many ways than, than the deep mutational scanning approach that most of you are familiar with. Um, we need to make variants proteome-wide, and we do this using errors in translation instead of DNA mutagenesis, and I'll talk about that. Um, next, as I said, we apply these biochemical, generic biochemical selections to protein function to the entire proteome in a single pool. And then, because these variants exist only at the protein level, we measure their changes in frequency by mass spectrometry. Um, and this method was originally developed by uh, Ricardo Rodriguez, who's a staff scientist in the VN lab. And all the work I'm going to talk about today uh, was done in collaboration with him and a grad student in the VN lab, Kyle Hess. So today I'm gonna to talk about two things. First, how we actually harness mistranslation to generate pools of protein variants. And then how we can look at these variants and identify those that alter a property of the protein. And then the example I'm gonna show, the property is thermal stability. So almost all the existing methods that, that you probably are familiar with generate protein variants by mutating the DNA. Um, and this makes a lot of sense. It's relatively easy to do. However, as we just kind of heard about in the last talk, there are some challenges with making large gene length libraries of protein variants for many proteins simultaneously, particularly if you don't want the mutations to be totally random. And in addition, depending on how these libraries were made, there can also be challenges in sequencing them. So we've chosen to take a completely different approach to making mutations entirely, and that's by engineering errors in translation or mistranslation. And in this case, the DNA stays completely wild type, and variants are only introduced at the protein level as the proteins are being synthesized. Now, there are multiple ways that you can harness mistranslation to diversify the proteome. Uh, the VN lab has worked quite a bit on introducing non-canonical amino acids that are incorporated by the native translational machinery. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about any of that work today, but Kyle Hess has a poster here today about that, so I encourage you to visit his poster. What I'm gonna talk about is some of the work I've done in order to engineer canonical amino acid substitution, so one na natural amino acid for another, mimicking genetically encoded missense mutations. The way we do this is by introducing uh, these mistranslating tRNAs into the cell or tRNAs that cause errors in translation, causing a swap from one amino acid to the other. And so to remind people, uh, the tRNA is the actual link between the genetic code and the amino acid sequence, and it brings the correct amino acid to the translational machinery by base pairing at the anti-codon sequence. So in this toy, in this example here, the phenylalanine codon UUC is typically decoded by a phenylalanine tRNA with a complementary anticodon. 
However, some tRNAs, uh, such as serine tRNAs, are completely plastic at the anticodon. So you can make any sequence there, um, and you can direct serine to that site. And so uh, we reasoned that if you introduce into the cell, say, a serine tRNA now with an anticodon complementary to, this, to a phenylalanine codon, uh, you can put serine in in place of phenylalanine. Um, and what you, what you will end up with then is a diverse proteome in which every phenylalanine site can be encoded by either serine or phenylalanine. Uh, and we worked with Eric Fisichi's lab at the University of Rochester. He developed a method to conditionally express tRNAs uh, in yeast, and I'm not going to talk too much about that today because it's already published, but we showed uh, with him that uh, if you take these serine tRNAs now with anticodon mutations and you conditionally introduce them into cells, so you induce the expression, in this case, two different serine tRNAs with two different anticodons, complementary to <laughs> phenylalanine or isoleucine codons, uh, you it causes toxicity for the cells, which is perhaps what you would expect if you're causing sort of massive errors in translation. But of course, we want to be able to detect these variants directly. Um, and since these variants exist only at the protein level. We can't use the deep sequencing methods that we all know and love very well. Um, so <laughs> instead, uh, uh, we use mass spectrometry. And in a typical mass spectrometry workflow, proteins are digested into small peptides, which can then be identified by their mass to charge ratio. Um, and so what we can do is we can simply search for every peptide that could contain a phenylalanine, we can search for a version of that peptide uh, that contains a serine instead. And we can identify these different peptides, variant peptides, by their mass shift and quantify them relative to their wild type counterpart. Uh, we did this uh, on protein from yeast expressing serine tRNAs uh, with anticodons that would direct serine at sites of many different amino acids, and six of them are shown here. Uh, and for, for all but uh, for five of the six, in this example at least, uh, we were able to detect the expected serine misincorporation events by mass spectrometry. And so what I'm showing here is the percentage of, of peptides with a serine substitution uh, compared to the wild type amino acid. And what you can see is that for all of these, you get between about five to maybe 10% of peptides have this substitution. Uh, and that's in contrast to a control sample in which you have very, very low levels of mistranslation. So now that we have these pools of protein variants, what we actually want to know is which ones of these are affecting function. So next I'm going to talk to you about how we can use uh, selections to identify variants that alter protein thermal stability. The approach we use to me measure protein thermal stability is uh, the thermal proteome profiling method developed by uh, the Savitsky lab. And the way this method works is that you can take a protein lysate or cells um, and treat it at increasing temperature. And all proteins, as, as they are heated, will eventually denature and misfold. And so as the proteome denatures and misfold, misfolds, the proteins will fall out of solution. And so if you use mass spectrometry now to measure the concentration of each protein in the soluble fraction at each different temperature, uh, you can monitor this, this, this unfolding process for each protein and essentially draw a melting curve for every protein. And so we reasoned that we could extend this method to look at protein variants by simply, uh, instead of looking at each protein just by itself, we could compare uh, the wild type peptides from that protein to the ones containing, in our case, serine variants. And what we would be looking for is variants that come out of solution at a lower or higher temperature than their wild type counterpart, suggesting that they are, uh, have increasing or decreasing the protein's thermal stability. So here's an example of how the real data actually looks. This is from a TPP experiment of uh, three replicates on protein from yeast expressing a tRNA that substitutes phenylalanine at serine sites. And I'm showing uh, one example peptide here from the protein TDH2. And in black, you can see the wild type version of that protein, which contains phenylalanine. 
Um, and in red, you can see the serine substitute version of this protein. And in this example, you can clearly see that the serine variant has reduced thermal stability. So for every pair of these wild type and mutant peptides that we detect, we can calculate a delta TM value uh, representing the difference between the wild type and variant. We actually performed this experiment on six different yeast strains expressing tRNAs that substitute serine at sites of six different amino acids. Um, and in these six experiments uh, total, we identified about 1,600 pairs of variant and wild type peptides uh, corresponding to about 400 proteins. And if we plot the uh, distribution of TM differences that we can see, we see that these are all centered for the most part around zero, although there are quite a number of variants that have large magnitude effects on TM of up to 10 or even 20 degrees. Uh, overall, about 15% of the variants in our experiment had a significant effect on TM. And of those, 78% uh, of them decreased TM, suggesting they're destabilizing the protein, which perhaps makes sense uh, because you think mutations are, are more likely to destabilize proteins than to stabilize them. So the first thing we wanted to do was to actually see if the variants we identify as stabilizing or destabilizing really are having an effect on the protein. So we chose one protein to sort of validate mutations in that had kind of multiple destabilizing mutations in it. And so that's this GAP-DH homolog TDH2. And what I'm showing you here uh, is all the positions for which we measured a serine variant. And the black bars are the positions in the, in the protein and the colored boxes uh, their corresponding effect on TM. And the starred ones are ones that significantly, uh, in this case, all of them destabilized uh, the protein. And so we took these four significant variants, uh, as well as three that had no effect on TM, and we made these mutations genetically now uh, in a sort of normal way in a tagged copy of TDH2 and measured the abundance of the protein. And what you can see is that all four of the variants that uh, had, would, uh, had large effects on TM strongly reduced the protein abundance. And this was true even at 30 degrees, suggesting that they really are destabilizing mutations, whereas the mutations that had no effect on TM had only a small effect on protein abundance. So I don't have too much time, but I wanted to quickly uh, just tell you about a couple of example proteins that we uh, covered in our assay to sort of highlight the kinds of things that we think we can learn from our approach. Uh, so the first one is this protein TPI1, uh, triose phosphate isomerase, and we were particularly struck by this protein because it had a relatively large number of destabilizing mutations. And uh, interestingly, uh, this is a protein is known to cause a rare Mendelian disease when mutated. And the mechanism of this rare Mendelian disease is actually missense mutations that cause the protein to become destabilized. So we wondered if the if we were actually identifying potentially pathogenic variants. And in fact, one of the variants that we measured, this F240S variant, is a pathogenic mutation in humans. And it, it is known to act by reducing protein thermal stability and abundance. Uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, a couple of slides. Um, actually, yeah. So, um, so we wondered if the other variants that we, we identified um, in, in TPI1 were also potentially loss of function mutations. Um, and so we picked a few of them to validate, ones that weren't necessarily known human disease alleles, and we made them uh, genetically in a tagged copy again of TPI1. And we saw that all four of our destabilizing variants actually significantly reduced protein abundance, although to varying degrees. Uh, and since TPI1 is an essential gene, both in yeast and in humans, uh, we asked also if they could complement the, the growth defect of a null mutant. And all four of the variants were loss of function to a degree, although two of them were complete loss of function and two were partial loss of functions, which correspond to their effect on abundance. And so what we, we think is that uh, we may actually be identifying mutations that could be potentially pathogenic mutations, um, and that this kind of strategy could be used to look at other homologs of disease, uh, human disease proteins, and identify potentially clinically relevant variation. 
So in like the last minute or so that I have, I just very quickly wanted to talk a little bit about these stabilizing mutations, because we were actually pretty surprised uh, to that although most of the variants that we detected decreased TM, uh, we found that about 20% of them increased TM. And that was surprising to us because you generally think it might be hard to stabilize a protein by a missense mutation. Um, but when we looked at, at what proteins these variants were in, we were struck by the fact that uh, about half of the significantly stabilizing variants were in homologs of HSP70 proteins. And HSP70, for those that don't know, is a conserved family of chaperones that bind to peptide substrates. Uh, and in yeast, there are 14 HSP70 proteins, and we covered 10 of them in our, in our experiment. And I'm showing one example of one of the HSP70 proteins that we covered in our experiment here, uh, the sh protein SSA2. And you can see it looks quite different than the other example proteins that I've showed you so far. There's a lot of stabilizing variation in it and relatively small amount of destabilizing variation. Uh, we don't actually understand why there are so many apparently stabilizing variants in HSP70 proteins, although we do have some hypotheses. Uh, but what's very interesting is when you map these variants on, uh, onto the protein structure, they cluster <laughs> Uh, in really two distinct areas of the protein, either this lobe one of the nucleotide binding domain or the beta sheets of the substrate binding domain, which are the part of the protein that actually contacts the peptide substrate. And based on a, a previous work, we expect that these mutations are actually loss of function mutations. Um, and we think that this suggests that the stabilizing variants we identify um, are probably just as likely to be loss of function variants as the destabilizing ones. Uh, so in conclusion, I told you about a new method that we're working on to use mistranslation to generate pro uh, variants proteome-wide, and how we can use this method to measure uh, mutation effects in hundreds of proteins in a single experiment. And doing this, we can find uh, loss of function variants, including those in clinically relevant proteins. So our vision for the future is to essentially be be able to scale this up to more proteins and more functions. Um, we think that uh, really any kind of function, aspect of function that has some kind of generic biochemical selection or fractionation method could be amenable to this, including things like protein-protein interactions or aggregation uh, or cat even catalytic activity. Uh, so finally, I'd like to just thank everybody uh, who worked on this project, particularly uh, Ricard and Kyle in the VN lab. And I don't know if I have much time, but I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>